Orthopedic Surgery Center of Vieira in Orlando, Florida. Actually, Space Coast of Florida, which is near Orlando. Today we have a patient uh, first case that is going to be a five disc areas that need to be repaired in his lower back. He's had back pain for 40 years and leg pain that goes into both legs, but worse on the left. We're going to get started. Sir, we're going to get started, okay? okay. I'm going to put some numbing medicine so you'll feel a little, a little stick and burn, but I don't want you jumping or moving around, all right? Now, he's had back surgery before, laminectomy done, and okay. you're going to just try to get comfortable. We're going to put you to sleep soon, but I need you awake for the beginning. Sound good? Yeah. All right. I'm giving you numbing medicine right now. I apologize. I know it's a bit uncomfortable. How's blood pressure? Okay. All right. I'll need some more local. You have more available? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna put this down. Let's get started on this side first and then we'll move to the other. So with these surgeries, since we're repairing herniated discs and spinal stenosis, where the nerves get pinched, we're gonna go from the side of the spine, we're gonna go through the foramen. That's where the nerves come out of the spine. It's where the disc is. And that's where specifically the disc herniation is. Just let me know if you need me to give you more numbing medicine. Just say, ouch, but don't move around, okay? All right. Let's give some more numbing. Shot. Oh, yeah, we need to be lower. Looks like we've infiltrated. Let me have that back. Yeah. Now he takes ibuprofen, Motrin, which you know, affects the uh, platelet's ability to, you see that? We have more blood loss from the injection or needle site than anything. Yeah, seven days is fine. He's going to still have a propensity to not form platelet plugs. Watch the needle there. Okay. We may need more local, by the way. Yes, uh, let me see. I don't know that he's been off. That would be helpful. Let me know. All right, so we're going to work on, we want to control the patient's blood pressure during the surgery. We really ideally want it around 110, 100 um, for what we're trying to do. Shot? Let's see where we are here. So now he's been suffering with back pain for 40 years. So. Um, it's affected his entire quality of life. I was talking to him about it earlier yesterday and his wife who's here with him. And they're from Phoenix, Arizona. And I was learning a little bit more about how, how he's been dealing with it over the years. Shot? All right, so for right now, we're gonna get focused on getting to where we need to be. We're aiming for the back of that L5S1 disc. Now he does have short pedicles. He has what we call congenital spinal stenosis. I'm on the facet joint now, but my alignment looks good. My trajectory looks good. So I just need to get around this facet. It's a bit enlarged. Nice job, Jordan. Shot. He's great. Thank you for keeping him so comfortable. Shot. Dr. Berndez. Shot. Yeah, that's wonderful. Look at that. Oh, I love it. All right. So the key is to get into the foramen in exactly the right spot. And I apologize that the x-ray picture is not so clear, but we're headed right to the back of that L5S1 disc. Everyone agree? Left side, 5-1 shot. All right. So shot. We're pretty close. Let's get an AP. Now, Jordan, I'd like to ask you a question about the Floro machine. Yes, this is our best Floro machine. There is a newer model. Your overall take on that newer model? Uh, seems very similar to uh, the one that we're using now. It's just that it's a uh, upper uh, pressure. Uh, 
Uh -huh. Is it worth uh, a lot of extra money compared to this one that we'd have to pay for it? Or is it pretty, in terms of the, forget about the software, just the functionality for the surgeon. Let's I'll go say lateral. I would say it is worth it. Is worth it? And it's better quality images, yes. better resolution for us so we can see what we're doing. Yes, yes for sure. All right. I thought we were going to try the, uh, the GE. Yeah. We can try the GE. Just it's the just GE is, I don't like GE. Yeah. Not because it's an American company. Is he okay? Shot. Where do you feel it? His shoulder? Oh, yeah. Well, try to move it around a little, get comfortable. Shot? No. I think I'm a little lower than I need to be. Let's get an AP. I'm using the x-ray to navigate to where exactly the tear is in the back of the disc. And rather than removing parts of the spine that are normal, like the lamina, doing a laminectomy, or removing uh, other parts of the spine, like the spinous processes or facet joints that other surgeons will do during open spine surgery, we are leaving all those normal structures alone. We call it leaving them intact. And by doing so, that maintains the stability of the spine. Shot? Maybe just a little bit higher than I am. And I keep coming to the same place. So I'm going to have to try to come back a little bit and try to aim a little bit higher. Shot? Yeah. Higher is in towards the head, okay? That's what I mean by higher. Shot? That looks a little bit better. So we're close at L5S1, but may have to go a little higher. Is he reliable? Shot? Oh, how are you? Fine. Yes, he's fine. Yes. You okay? Yes, I'm fine. Yeah. Shot? We're, this is the hardest part of the surgery, my friend. Just bear with us, Shot. You having any discomfort? No. What do you say? No. All right, shot. And you're pulsing? Uh, not right now, but I'm going to pulse. Okay. Remember, we always want to pulse. Shot? Let's see. So I'm, what I'm doing here, for those of you studying my technique, shot, uh, I am withdrawing the needle back, and I'm repositioning it, realigning it, and re-aiming it. Shot? and trying to get into the disk space at 5.1. And what I'm doing is I'm, I, I'm the facet joint right there. Show them the facet joint so people understand. This facet joint is, is so enlarged from arthritis that it's pushing me, shot, pushing me um, away from where I want to go. So I keep pulling back and coming back in again um, hoping to try to get in exactly where I want to go, but I could feel the facet, Sean. Oh, that's better. There we go. That's a little better, Sean. Eh, we're almost there. It's sitting right there on the cusp of the, of the end plate at, at S1. All right. I'm going to have to be happy with that. So at this point, on the left side, we're going to be going for three discs, L3, 4, L4, 5, and L5, S1. And we're going to start, we started with L5, S1, the most difficult. And the reason for that is it sets your entry point for L5, S1. And what that means is it sets your, your because L5, S1 is the hardest to get into, you have to adjust your entry point, medial, lateral, rostral, caudal. But once you find the perfect entry point in the skin, 
to get to where you want to be, that's where you have to make your incision because the other discs are easier to get to. And they, if you start your entry point based on where the other discs are to get to, you may not be in the right entry point for 5-1. So you always start with 5-1. Are you comfy? He's doing great. All right, now we're going to go to 4-5. And you can see there's scoliosis of the spine. It's twisted. Um, that's why the discs are not lining up for all the discs. We're having to adjust the fluoro. And when you line up for one disc, the other discs are not lined up. So that means the patient has scoliosis, which we knew he had scoliosis before. Sean, we're not here to fix scoliosis. We're here to fix his pain in his back and his legs. So you can see the needle is aiming right for L4-5. Looks pretty good right there, shot. Mm -hmm. Shot. You comfy? Yes. Shot. Huh? Yes. No, he just said something else. He's very collapsed. Shot? Try to relax a little bit. Shot? All right, try to line those discs up a little better on the back of the disc. You see the pedicle of L4 is off. See if you can, oh, that's better. So we're hitting the top of L5. That's the problem. All right. So once again, we're not in the disc yet at this disc level, but we need to be a little higher. Shot? Shot? And it's actually quite interesting. If you capture the facet shot just right, then you can, you can kind of, capture the tissue of the facet joint with your needle and I do that all the time and it helps direct the tip to where I want it to go there we go so you see what I did there folks for those of you watching um, and for those of you wanting to learn the technique I pulled back to the facet the needle itself has a beveled tip so it can be steerable to where I want it to go by um, let me show you guys you see this line right here? Yep, we see it. Okay, it doesn't have one on the other side. That's because the line tells you the tip. You see the tip here, how it's beveled? Yep. So as it passes through tissue, it's gonna go that way. So it goes away from the line. So you can s know where the bevel is and the direction the needle will go based on this little marker right here. Uh, these are beautiful needles. And you can, you have to, get good at being what's called a needle jockey. And I used to make fun of Dr. Patel and for being a needle jockey, but the reality is, is that um, you are jockeying this needle into a position uh, in the spine where it's supposed to be. And so, um, <laughs> man, he's taking the needles right to the limit. You guys see that? The heads of the, the needles are literally right at the skin um, point with the entry point. So. I'm going to have to see what I can do here. I may have to use another entry point, Sean. All right. I may have to. I'm not saying I do yet. I'm going to give it a, a Boy Scout. What do they say? A Boy Scout's try? Sean? Just lay still. You're fine. You're doing great. Sean? Huh? Uh-huh. Yeah, so we're about to enter the foramen, shot. All right, let's get an AP and verify our position. So when you use the x-ray machine to navigate, remember the x-ray is giving you a, just a two-dimensional view, not three-dimensional. So you really need more than one set of two-dimensional information to navigate three-dimensionally. That looks pretty good. Everything all right? Yeah. yeah. So you can see the top needle there, Jordan. We're right at the entrance of the disc. Show them that with the cursor. That's the left L34 needle. 
and show them some of the bone spurs. We're not removing these because they're not doing anything, but lots of people have bone spurs. Uh, they do not cause any symptoms. I get asked about these all the time. Um, surgeons go on and tell patients that they need their bone spurs removed, which is nonsense. 99% um, of bone spurs don't need to be removed. Yeah. Are you okay? At, at the skin or in your spine? Sean? What? There's definitely some calcium right here. Now this is a, <laughs> is a bone spur that does need to be treated. All right. Sean? Beautiful. All right. So folks, we've, we've accessed the, the target discs on the left side. Now we're going to start the right. While we do that, Henry, would you mind showing our audience why do herniated discs, degenerated discs, bulging discs, they're all the same, um, just different stages of, of development. Why does a bulging disc or herniated disc or degenerated disc cause back pain? Our patients had back pain on and off for 40 years. He had surgery 40 years ago with his first microdiscectomy, and now he's having you know, his spine corrected, but he's lived with horrible debilitating back pain and leg pain on both sides, worse on the left for, for 40 years. And it's really gotten bad in the last year or two. All right, I'm going to give you some more numbing medicine, okay? You're going to feel a little stick and burn. Don't be angry. Everything is okay, I promise you. Everything's going well. No problems. You're doing great. Yeah, we're just giving you numbing medicine, that's all. So it's, unfortunately, it's a little uncomfortable. I apologize. All right. So believe it or not, the putting the numbing medicine in can actually be the most painful part of the whole surgery. Um, so... But once you get it in, usually the patients feel better. They don't feel the poking that goes on behind their back. <laughs> you like that, behind their back? All right. Anyway, let's go ahead and run our video showing why do herniated discs cause back pain. Traumatic injury to the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissues develop within the annular tear, causing back pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause symptoms to worsen. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to nearby nerve roots, causing leg pain. Signals travel up nerves to the brain, causing localized back pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, Submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Welcome back. Um, we are still working on getting into the tear in the back of the disc on the right side at L45. Uh, AP view. So far, things are going very well for the patient. Um, I'm into the discs at three, four, four, five. I'm in the foramen at the back of the disc at five, one, being pushed laterally by that facet. No, let me actually be in the disc at five, one, two. Yeah, actually it's looking good. Looking, you can see the scoliosis too. You can see the curvature of the spinous processes. Why don't we show the audience? Oh, <laughs> well, next time. Um, all right, let's see, shot. 
We're just about done at here at 4.5. We need bilateral access. So why are we doing both sides at L4.5? Man, there's a big tear here, I think. And we're doing both sides because he's got leg pain on both sides, folks. We have to decompress the nerves on both sides. He's got weakness, numbness. You doing all right, buddy? I'm going to be putting you to sleep in five minutes. You're doing fantastic. I appreciate you, you just not being a moving target. And honestly, it's going better than I thought it would um, because of all your prior surgery and all the scar tissue in there in the back of the spine and bone spurs and twisting of the spine. But we've been able to, to do what we need to do. So I think you're going to be very happy with these results once we're done, OK? So thanks for bearing with us, Shot. You haven't made it easy for me by any means, but um, we're getting it done. And that's what matters, huh? All right. Why don't we show our audience then why we do the Duke laser disc repair? How does it work? Why do we bother doing this surgery, shot? And the answer, of course, is that it fixes people and takes away their pain and makes them very, very happy to live life and do things again. Shot. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Welcome back. I'm just drawing his discs. <clears throat> He's going to want to see this later. So remember what I told you, he's had 40 plus years of back pain. 80%, yeah, get comfortable, my friend. You're gonna be going to sleep soon. 80% of the reason he's here today is because he has back pain. And we're gonna get rid of that because it's coming from his discs. 20% of his problem is his legs. We call it neurogenic claudication, sciatica, radiculopathy. He's got weakness, numbness. That's the radiculopathy part. He's got pain down his legs. He can't even stand straight. If you saw this man, he literally, if this is straight, can you see my hand here? He's bent forward like this, probably by around 25 degrees when he walks around. He uses a cane. There's no way for a man to live that way or anybody to live that way. So right now we're going to test these discs. He's got tears at both sides at three, four, four, five. It's the nerves come down and go down his legs, and the herniations are pushing on the nerves on both sides, okay? And more than one nerve. They're pushing on several nerves. All right, and then the 5-1 is on the left side. Is he okay? You comfy? I apologize. Well... We don't fix shoulders, unfortunately. Try to get it comfortable. You can move it around till you're comfortable. Let me know uh, when you found a comfortable spot. You there? Yeah. All right. Uh, How bad is that on a scale of one to 10? Uh, All right, is that where you typically get your back pain? Uh, I'm not your friend anymore, am I? Don't worry, you'll forgive me tomorrow. And you may not even remember, but you'll watch the video and remember. 
I apologize, but the good news is, my friend, L34 is definitely causing your back pain. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah. Better. See how quick it gets better as soon as you come off the pressure? So imagine every time somebody sits or stands, they're putting pressure on their disc, just like I put pressure there, and that's causing his severe pain. So he, he can't even do anything in life. He's totally incapacitated. You better? Yeah. All right, good. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? Yeah. That's another 10. Is that where you get your back pain typically? Yeah. Yeah. So they're both concordant. All right. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I think we're done, but I may want to just check one little thing, okay? Yeah. All right. I appreciate you being a good, good sport with me. So we're going to put you to sleep in about 30 seconds, okay? Yeah. And then when you wake up, we'll be done. Your shoulder's going to be a little sore because you've got some arthritis in there, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I know you do. You better? Yeah, I don't think that's going in. Let's see. Shot? Yeah, it's not. So we're right at the outside of the disc. We're going to have to uh, navigate in. Okay, you get to go to sleep, my friend. So we're unable to test 5-1. Um, but L34 was a 10 out of 10 concordant, L45, 10 out of 10 concordant. The reason I couldn't test L5S1, and I want to do 5-1 last, is because L5S1 needle, because the facet's pushing me lateral, I'm sitting right outside the disc, so I have to still get in. I'm going to save that for last, because that's going to be the hardest to do. And I want to clean, clear out these other needles before I start. All right, we're going to use the x-ray machine at this point to check our position of our guide wire, which looks good. There we go. Any questions from the audience? No current questions. Now, folks, why did people live with back pain for 40 years? The answers, I'll tell you. The most common reasons I hear Number one, they didn't know there was a way to fix it. So they just were unaware that it could be fixed because they've been told there is no way to fix it. They've been told by doctors, nurses, everybody, insurance companies. And until now, we haven't been able to cure back pain. Until now, until Duke Spine Institute essentially discovered the two, sorry, three most common causes, but really two. One of them is fracture, which we didn't discover, but vertebral body fractures have been known to cause pain for a long time. We didn't discover that, but we discovered the disc and the facet joint and a way to eliminate the pain at the disc and facet joint by repairing them in such a way that it takes the pain away. In most people we treat, it's permanent. So awareness, lack of awareness that back pain can be cured. That's the number one reason people don't get their backs fixed and they live with pain for 20 years, 30 years, longer, all right? So we would like to raise awareness about new treatments that are now available to people with back pain that they can use these treatments to get better. And our patient here is doing that today. Hold on. Shot? Check the integrity of the wire when we take it out. Shot? You just see the bend at the tip? I'm just concerned. So he's got pretty collapsed discs. Um, can you put that there, shot? Yeah, that's better. Can you put that there? I need to direct the dilator. Sometimes you actually have to direct the dilator to go where you want it to go, shot? And that's what I'm doing, that's better. Thank you for your help. I don't know what I'd do without Luis. Yep. Yeah. See what I mean? That angle is so tight. So we're just checking the guide wire. It's a little bent. We're going to get a new guide wire. 
for the next one. All right, we are in the disc, and this is the L45 disc. We're going to start with on the left side. We've got five disc tears and herniations to fix. Like I said, most patients are unilateral. We go on one side, the side of their leg symptoms, but he's got leg problems and stenosis on both sides. So we're going to fix his spinal stenosis with the surgery. We're going to get rid of his back pain from the discs. Now about 15% of our patients that have this surgery end up coming back with some type of back pain, but it's not the same. It's a different kind of pain. It usually is what's called the facet joints, F-A-C-E-T. And I showed you the facet joints earlier. Jordan, will you mind? Let's go to the x-ray view. Let's show our audience the facet joints again. Uh, go to a facet joint away from there. There, uh, up higher, to the left, down. That big knobby thing right there. Yeah, no. Keep going all the way right No, 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 down. There you go, that. Circle that whole circle there. Yeah, that's the facet joints, okay? And it's full of arthritis. Show them the arthritis, the bone spurs on the back side and the front side. Yep. See those little bone, bone spurs, protuberances to the left there? Yep. Those are indication of arthritis, plus the enlargement of the joint itself, called the set joint hypertrophy, is an indication of arthritis. So this patient also has arthritis in his facet joints. Now, I didn't create that arthritis. That was created by, unfortunately, most likely his laminectomies that he's had, his three back surgeries he's had in the prior to me fixing him today. Now, he's had three back surgeries over those 20 years, and he's never gotten rid of his back pain. It's just gotten worse. And once again, the reasons why, number one, people don't know they can get rid of back pain. Now, like every other true American, he, ble he bleeds red, white, and blue. You see that? Yes, we see it. All right. It's either that or he's half alien. Now, I watched an alien movie the other day on Apple TV, on Apple Movies. Um, it's called Nope, N-O-P-E. It's pretty good. Anybody see that? Nope. Not yet. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I thought we, had, we were not going to see any more alien movies for a while, but this was actually a good one. Really well done. Very entertaining. If you get a chance, I recommend it. It was a bit expensive. I had to pay 20 bucks to watch it, but... It was worth it, it was quite entertaining. Now for those of you who don't know this, I operated on my mom two days ago here at Duke Spine. Her cervical spine, she had um, basically really bad, she's almost 80, she had bad scoliosis of the spine with compression of the nerves and spinal cord. She was not a laser surgery candidate because it wasn't a herniated disc and it wasn't a degenerated disc. It was true instability, which is very rare, by the way. So she needed a decompression infusion, an ACDF. We did not broadcast her surgery because she didn't want to. Uh, I asked, but uh, we've, we've got hundreds of ACDFs you can watch on our YouTube channel if you're interested. I've broadcasted them over the years. I've done 1,000 ACDFs myself in 26 years as a surgeon and pretty much stopped doing them because of the laser surgery works so much better. But in a rare instance, there's a situation where it's not the herniated disc and it's not neck pain. She had no neck pain, by the way. She just had numbness tingling in her hands. I had already done a carpal tunnel surgery on her successfully, but she had radiculopathy and we had to unpinch the nerves in her spine, in her neck, so I did that. And she's doing fantastic. She's 80 years old. She went home an hour, a couple hours after surgery. And I took care of her the first night, made sure she was fine, which she was. She actually was eating a cheeseburger a few hours later. And then half a burrito. Huh? Great anesthetic. Great anesthetic. She had the best anesthesiologist, Dr. Berndez. But um, it just shows you it's, she's 80 years old. And she was losing function in her hands, like because the nerves are getting pinched. And basically, she needed surgery. And I put her off as long as I thought we could. Again, her issue was not neck pain, as many people's issue is neck pain. Her issue was basically nerve damage and spinal cord damage from being pinched. All right, so far, so good. This is, remember, L45. 
And this patient has had surgery at this already multiple times. Look at the blue herniated disc material. You can see the dye coming out. To the right, that pink thing at 3 o'clock is the end plate at um, L, L5. And the herniated disc and the annular tear is right there. And that's what we're going to be debriding. I don't want to debride the end plate. I want to debride the annular tear right there. And we talk about granulation tissue be from chronic inflammation. You can still see some pinkness in there. You got baby blue, which is our dye that we use, the Duke Spine dye. And you've got granulation tissue, and then you've got annulus, and you've got calcium, and you've got a lot of scar tissue. So it's kind of a mess. This is what we debride and remove with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. By doing this, we get rid of the pain. This patient's primary reason for surgery today is back pain. That's it. He's here for his back pain. He wants to get rid of it. And I determined from his MRI review, because he's from Arizona, I determined from his examination during the MRI review that he had discogenic back pain. In other words, back pain that came from a disc as opposed to a fracture or an infection or a tumor or the facet joints or the SI joints or the piriformis muscle. His problem, his primary pain was from the discs and specifically L3-4, L4-5, and L5-S1. So here we are repairing those discs by doing the Duke Laser Disc Repair. We've been doing this surgery now for 16 years here at Duke Spine in Florida. And um, we've done over 1,500 patient surgeries with this procedure with an average for the lower back, 92% elimination of preoperative back pain. 92% of back pain on average gone. And that's with six years of average follow-up. We've published this study. We have it available. I would like to put it on our website. Um, can you do that, by the way? Henry, can you talk to Annette? Yes. I just thought of that. And we should try to put our other papers, too. We need a, a web page for scientific publications, peer-reviewed publications. All right, let's laser off. You can see the epidural space at the top. We're going to be here a while. This surgery will take um, from skin to skin about two hours total, um, maybe just shy of it. But he's got a lot of degenerative stuff going on in the disc, and I want to make sure we get it all. You can see pieces of herniation like that one right there in the crack that I pushed in earlier. There we go. All right, we do take questions during the surgery. If you have a question, I'd be happy to try to answer it for you. If it's spine related or insurance related or anything to do with the spine. There's a her Let's show them that herniation right there. Light on. Light on, please. Ceiling, ceiling. Can you see this here, Henry? Yes, we can. I just took that herniation out. You see the blue color and then the white as well? It's all white stuff is scar tissue. The blue stuff is degenerated nucleus propulsus. All right, lights off. Back to the scope, please. Any questions from our audience? No current question. All right, let's show our audience what alternative surgery would be available for a patient like this with back pain and leg symptoms from pinched nerves in their back. That surgery would be the spinal fusion, lumbar fusion, it's called. Now, I've done a 1,000 lumbar fusions in my career, as well as a 1,000 cervical fusions. I stopped counting after a 1,000, by the way. So it's more than a 1,000, but not much more than a 1,000. Duke Laser Disc Repair. A comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A patient with chronic back or neck pain originating from a symptomatic disc injury could undergo either traditional spinal fusion or less invasive Duke laser disc repair. This MRI represents a typical case with L45 and L5S1 symptomatic discs. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, 
degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. To accommodate the fusion hardware, a large bone grabber is used to perform a laminectomy by removing bone from the spine. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large pedicle screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. The fusion screws are inserted into the bone, as shown in the x-ray. After all screws are in place, rods are used to connect the screws together to prevent movement of the secured vertebrae. Crosslinks are added to bridge the rods together for additional stability. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home, enjoying life, with a very fast recovery, allowing normal activities without pain. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. Prior to closing the wound, a temporary drain is installed to allow excess fluid to drain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke laser disc repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware-free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. 
Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma, resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke Laser Disc Repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke Laser Disc Repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke Laser Disc Repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, normal movements of the joint in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. In fact, most Duke Laser Disc Repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke Laser Disc Repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. Welcome back. Hopefully you understand the difference between a spinal fusion, which is a very invasive surgery. It requires post-operative painkillers like narcotics versus the Duke Laser Disc Repair, which is minimally invasive, safe, and more effective than a fusion. No screws and rods are necessary with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. All right, we were just going to pick up. We were talking about one of my medical school at USC, Los Angeles, one of my classmates, Neil Chatterjee. And I was telling my team here that Neil um, was at USC, Los Angeles, studying undergrad, or I'm sorry, not USC, UCLA undergrad. And while he was studying for an exam one night, his family, um, his mom, dad, brother, sister, they were all coming home from a party and a drunk driver hit them and killed them. He lost his entire family in one moment. And that was during his undergrad years. So Neil, I guess, decided he wanted to be a doctor after that and applied to med school. He had great grades, of course. He was like a straight A student in undergrad. Got into USC with me and my class. We had 175 top students from around the country. And Neil was one of them. Neil had long hair, he was Indian. Neil Chatterjee, never forget him. And he was a soccer player. So when we had our med school soccer team of the students and faculty at the USC med school, we used to play in Los Angeles. He was part of our team. Uh, no, a little more irrigation. Anyway, um, Neil lived in Malibu during med school. And we saw him the first day of class, and then I never saw him again. <laughs> He would go surfing every single day. You know, he had a totally different view of life after that experience. He wouldn't come to class. He would show up if tests at USC med school were every eight weeks. Eight weeks, we had a week of tests. Another eight weeks of class, a week of tests. He would show up two nights before the tests, literally 48 hours. And that's the first time in eight weeks he'd show up. <laughs> he would come straight to me and say, can I borrow your notes? <laughs> because I had the best notes because I would actually rewrite all the book notes, lecture notes, and con consolidate it into a set of notes that I would review. You didn't have a note service? No, I did, you, you don't want a note service. You want to create your own. That's how you learn. You don't want to use a note. I was the note service. So of course I gave him my notes, right? So Neil was getting 
barely passing grades in med school, barely uh, passing. He said, I just want to go into Plural. primary care, Plural. you know, and have no aspirations, just be a, be a primary care doctor, which, you know, you can get C's and get into primary care. Then he goes into his clinical rotations, like you and me, third year. And he takes general surgery. And when he's on general surgery, he rotates through trauma surgery. Neil became a changed man. I mean, literally, after that experience of trauma surgery, he now wants to be a surgeon. Now, surgery, you have to get A's in med school. Can't have C's. Huh? USC, USC, that's where we were, yeah. trauma that's surgery. I mean, so he got in with all the residents and fellows. They loved him in the attending shop, and they offered him a trauma surgery fellowship after gen they gave him general surgery and then trauma. I mean, his grades were horrible, <laughs> but they saw the passion and they saw the um, potential in Neil. He's a brilliant guy. He just wasn't trying. He was surfing every single day. Literally, we never saw him in class, ever. He would show up literally two days before exams. And just so you know, folks, I would literally for eight weeks study every day, every moment, every waking moment I had just to, to, to prepare for my exams in med school because there's so much ma material and information. I felt like I was drinking out of a fire hose every single day. And Neil would show up. <laughs> and he would pass his exams. Just show up two days before, incredible. What a story. I, I hope Neil's doing well. I haven't talked to him in a long time. He's moving around a little bit. Lay still, everything's okay. All right, we finished L45 on the left. We're gonna do L34 next, and then we're gonna work our way down to L5S1. All right, let me know when you're ready, doctor. Can you hold this here? You're doing great. Lay still. Now, I don't know if the patient's awake or not, folks. I just say that because if he can, for some reason, hear anything, I want him to know everything's okay. doesn't mean I'm having an actual conversation with the patient. But in the event that he is awake and hearing me, I do want him to know everything is okay. So I will say that doesn't mean he's actually hearing me. So some people comment in the, you know, on these streams, these live streams, why is the patient so awake? But it doesn't mean they're awake. And the movement we're seeing is reflex. This is not conscious movement, okay? Wiggling your body is not a conscious type movement. It's a brainstem movement. It's a primordial, I'm a still, parts of my brain are still in that human slug phase of evolution. <laughs> where you have to wiggle your body to get away, right? Anybody ever see Anybody ever see bacteria moving? What do we call it? Anybody know the name of that movement? Brownian motion, Brownian motion. And what it is is the bacteria just move around, wiggling around with their little flagella and constant state of wiggling movement, right? And so very primordial, no nervous system, one cell. It just shows you that wiggling movement is very basic. It's, it's genetically encoded into even the oldest of life forms. So wiggling around on the operating table is not higher cortical function. It's actually brainstem function. So don't, don't think of him as being awake and conscious because he's not. He's actually asleep. He's just moving his body in a, a rhythmic type way that is uh, more out. Yeah. That is more um, reflex. Okay. If someone is poking you while you're asleep at night, you're going to wiggle your body the same way. Right, Dr. Bernadez? All right, any questions from our audience? We have uh, two comments and a question. Uh, Rock and roll, let's have them. 
Uh, the first two comments come from Janet Parker on Facebook. Hi, Janet from Facebook. Welcome to our live stream. Her first comment was, uh, sh uh, said, uh, share, share, share. Not enough people know about this and have back surgeries that don't help. Yeah, Janet, I agree with you. That's why we're trying to get the word out. But here's the truth. Facebook, social media platforms, they all, they're all, blo they all block this content, unfortunately. They age restrict it, which makes it hard for people under 18 to see. I've talked to my staff about it. It's not fair because there are young people with back pain and they get marginalized by the system. Their doctors tell them there's nothing wrong, that they need to just live with it. And you know, I've operated on 15 year olds. For example, I operated on a 15 year old girl who injured her back in a skiing accident. And she was just getting the runaround by all the doctors in Los Angeles, California. And then they found us and we fixed her back pain with this laser surgery. Why? Because we know that back pain has a source. We don't just tell people it's in their heads and that they just need to live with it. So I feel horrible for people having to live with pain for 40 years like this patient right here. Yes, we're trying to spread the word, but that's really gonna come down to you. Unfortunately, Facebook, we even have a Facebook support group with 3000 members. Every time I post a beautiful post, it gets to about 30 members, like 1%. Oh yeah, and climbing. Sometimes we get 15 members in one day, new ones. Point is, Facebook doesn't allow our content to be seen even by the members of our, our group. Why? They want me to pay for it. They want, they want to charge me money to, they call it boosting the post. I'll give them something they can boost. So, you know, they, they've taken people suffering, which we're trying to help people get out of suffering by educating them, and they're turning it into a profit for themselves, which make me sick. But, you know, they sh this should be public service announcement. You know what a PSA is? Anybody who's lived long enough knows what a PSA is. P PSA stands for public service announcement. And it really means that. It's a radio announcement that's not paid for. It's free. And it's done by the radio station because they want the public to know something significant is happening for the, to the public. Like a what? Yeah, like flu shots. And basically it's unpaid. So there's no revenue or advertising income. And that's the old days. I was a DJ in a radio station and we did PSAs all the time where we would announce things to the public that were a benefit to the public, but it was a free announcement because if it wasn't free, nobody would be paying for it. Nobody would know about it. So that's why there needs to be a sharing communication of information. So I appreciate your comments and your sentiment. We're doing our best to educate, but we're a small company with a limited budget. And I don't have a lot of money to go do big public, public announcements and hire a PR firm. So we just try to do it this way where it's free for us, free for you to watch. For those of you who do have back or neck pain or know somebody, we do offer a free MRI review. And would you mind sharing that link, Henry? Henry is our, in charge of our broadcast and um, he's doing a great job. What's the next question? There's the tear, by the way. You see that tear with the blue tongue? Literally the annular tear, this is the back of the disc, that's the annulus, the white thing on one side, annulus on the other, torn in the middle with herniation stuck in the tear. This is what the Duke laser disc repair fixes. It removes the interposed herniation, which is that we just showed you interposed because it's in between the annular tear fibers and debridement of the annular tear. One of my staff was on the phone with somebody yesterday who was saying, how is what Dr. Duke does different than what's done here in London at this London Spine Center? And there's a huge difference. What they do in London there is a percutaneous laser disc where they stick a needle in and they just stick the laser down the needle and go like this. They go like this, that, 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 done. Okay, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't work. That's why we don't do it here. We have to do endoscopic laser surgery. It's very different than percutaneous laser surgery. And it actually works. My procedure works. That's why it costs more money. It's because it requires expensive equipment, staff. We have an entire full operating room here, a sterile OR in a facility 
that literally is a $15 million facility. So you can't, um, you have to charge money. You can't do these things for free. There's no, who's going to pay the bills? And th by the way, that $15 million is an initial investment in the building and the equipment. That doesn't even account for recurring ongoing costs that we have every month. So people think, you know, surgery is cheap. It's not. It's very expensive. And to be quite honest with you, I was just talking with my team a few minutes ago about these x-ray machines, right? This x-ray machine literally... If, you're, if you lived in China or had access in China, you could build one of these things in China for $5,000. But we pay, thanks, we pay $150,000 markup. So, you know, the cost in medicine for equipment and supplies is ridiculous. The government doesn't help us in any way. All they do is tax us. They should be regulating the supply costs and making it more affordable, but they don't. Um, and because everything is so expensive for us, we have to pass that on to patients because where else are we going to get the money from? But patients and insurance companies. All right, what's the next question? Next question comes from uh, Diana Correa on Facebook. Hi, Diana. Welcome to our broadcast. And she asked, what kind of uh, anesthesia is used for this? Yeah, great question. So for the lower back ones that we're doing, all the lumbar, it's um, propofol sedation, intravenous, with uh, MAC, monitored anesthetic care. So basically oxygen, monitoring CO2, monitoring vitals. You have end tidal CO2 monitoring, right? Yeah, so everything, it's just called MAC. It's like a deep sedation, right? Is that what it is? Deep nasal oxygen and mask oxygen. Yeah, nasal and mask oxygen both, so. But the patient is not intubated. There's no tube down the patient's throat. And the reason for that is I need their help in the beginning. You saw that where I need their input on the discogram stuff. And I need their input as well on whether I'm getting too close to a nerve, starting to irritate it. In the beginning, when I'm putting the needle in, they'll tell me if I'm too close to the nerve root. They'll say, oh yeah, I have pain going down my leg. And then I gotta move and adjust my position. So I absolutely need them um, awake for that. Now, there are cases where patients um, are not able to be awake and we have to just do our best with them asleep, but that's rare. Most of the time, our patients are awake in the beginning. Great question. Yeah. Yeah, so Dr. Berndez is saying when you, when you do it this way with sedation and you don't do general, you have less risk of nausea and vomiting, less risk of um, D DVT, deep venous thrombosis. What else? Less risk of a sore throat. Yeah. So basically, general anesthesia, when you're completely asleep and the tube is down, has a higher risk of complications. So we save it for the cases where we absolutely need it. Those are the cervical, the ones we do on the neck. Great question, thanks. Yeah, feel free to type your questions up. I'll do my best to answer them for you. That's what we're here for, is to teach. We love the anesthesia questions. We like all kinds of questions related to spine world, but this is supposed to be a live broadcast so you can see what I see while I'm doing the surgery. You can experience what I'm experiencing and you can ask questions and get answers while I'm here. Um, I get a lot of people texting me, uh, direct messaging me questions and it's like I don't have time to answer literally hundreds and hundreds of people on my uh, direct message. Um, but you know, I do make myself available during these broadcasts to answer questions because honestly, uh, what I'm doing here at this point, it doesn't take a lot of, uh, a lot of, I should be careful how I say it, but it doesn't take a lot of focus. I can actually multitask. Um, and we're, as neurosurgeons, we're, we're trained to multitask. We may be in the operating room operating on a patient and 
we get a call from the nurse on the ICU and she's telling us our patients having problems or dying, what do we do? And we need to get a CAT scan. So we give orders, we have a conversation, we do medical decision making over the phone or in person, you know, they come into the operating room. So it's very common for surgeons to manage other things while they're operating. It's not that I'm doing, I'm the only one doing it. We do it all the time, it's standard. Um, but I think I'm the only one who broadcasts all of our surgeries live. We're the only place in the world that broadcasts all of our surgeries live, except for my mom's ACDF, of course. If a patient doesn't want their surgery broadcast live, we won't do it. But I would say most patients are very happy to broadcast their surgery live so their family and friends can watch. Other questions? Uh, no current questions, but another comment from Janet Parker on Facebook. And she has said, I have sent your videos to people I know that have failed back surgeries because you are awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I can't take credit myself. Um, you know, I have an entire team of people here that are amazing. And honestly, they make me look good. <laughs> uh, they make my job easy, I'll be honest. If I didn't have this team of support here at the surgery center in Duke Spine, then I, it, would be a, it would be a struggle to do what I do. So thank you for the comment. I take the compliment for everybody on behalf of everyone here. Uh, we enjoy what we do. We love helping people. We love helping people get out of pain. And this is a special treat to be able to do these treatments and get people out of back pain or neck pain or arm pain or leg pain. And we consider it a blessing. I personally uh, see it as my purpose professionally right now uh, that I've been uh, a path has been laid out for me and that's what I'm doing so I believe in divine inspiration and I've been inspired over the years to do things like these surgeries or teach patients now huh it's my calling now look at this 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 is a good example of an interposed herniation all this blue thing it looks like an iceberg it's stuck between the end plates of the bone right in the annular tear. I'm gonna to try to get more of it out, but at some point, I'm gonna get as much of the herniation out as we can, and then we're gonna be done. And I'm, I got about five minutes left on this particular disc. But things are going very well. All that is scar tissue, by the way, and herniated disc right there. The blue, the blue part is herniation of the nucleus, the nucleus, nucleus propulsus. And the reason it stains blue is it's degenerated from the inflammation that comes along with being inside this tear right here. So the tear actually changes the nucleus and it makes it degenerated. We want to fix the tear so the degeneration will stop. All this is done without fusion. It's done without artificial discs. This is the next level surgery beyond fusion and artificial discs. When every spine surgeon in the world knows how to do the Duke laser disc repair and has the equipment, training, staff to do it, there will be no more fusions, except maybe 1% of the cases we're fusing now. The other 99% will not need a fusion. So yeah, you're right. The word does need to get out. It's very important. Fusions are bad. They're very painful. They're very risky. Lots of complications with other surgeons doing them. They lead to more fusions. They're very expensive and unnecessary. But I'm only one person and I can only spread so much of the word. I need help from other people who care. It's a grassroots effort. All right, any other questions? Yes, we have another question from Diana on Facebook. And Diana's question was, does this surgery help with severe cervical foraminal stenosis or is it mostly for bulging discs? Yes, Diana, thanks for asking on Facebook. So what is stenosis, cervical stenosis? It's narrowing, stenosis means narrowing. And you have to ask yourself, what's causing the narrowing? And the answer is almost always a herniated disc is the cause of the narrowing. So just because you have a stenosis doesn't mean it's not coming from a herniated disc or a disc osteophyte, which is a herniated disc with a bone spur. This surgery is wonderful for that condition. 
We treat cervical stenosis all the time and herniated discs, degenerated discs, bulging discs, all the time with this procedure. It works very well. So this is the perfect procedure for that condition. And we've actually peer reviewed it and published it. So you can find it peer reviewed and published in the National Library of Medicine. If you just go to Google and type in PubMed, that's P-U-B-M-E-D, go ahead and type that up for her. And when you get to PubMed, there's a big search bar. Just type in Duke Laser Disc Repair, spelled D-E-U-K. And you will see this surgery for cervical spine has been published as very effective at treating symptoms of stenosis like arm weakness, numbness, tingling, and pain. All right, we're done here at this disc. We've cleaned it out beautifully. Um, the nerve root is going to be right up here to the left. Actually, there's a little bit more right there I want to get. That's why I always check. The white stuff next to the laser fiber is scar tissue. This stuff I'm zapping is herniation. You see how the, all this stuff is scar tissue and bone spur, and, but it's, we've chopped out the part that's actually problematic that's moving. Right here. This is the last of it. This is great. We're just about done with this disc. Then we're going to go to L5S1. How is he? Good. We're going to need him nice and asleep for the next part. It will be stimulating. All right. Any more questions from our audience? Yes. Another question from Diana. Uh, and she asked, how about cervical instability? I also have that too. Yeah, Diana, um, great question. The best thing to do is to honestly upload your MRI onto our free MRI review portal. Would you mind typing that address up? So to answer your question, what is cervical instability? There's different definitions of it, but if you have had trauma, significant trauma, and your spine is literally wobbling around, and you can see that on flexion extension x-rays, then you do have cervical instability if you've got more than, say, three millimeters. If you have four millimeters of listhesis, then that is considered unstable. If you have ligamentous injuries um, where the ligaments have been destroyed from trauma, like a car accident, then that would support instability. But there are diff different definitions of instability out there, and I don't know what definition you're using. Are you using the white and Punjabi definition? What, how are you determining you have instability? Is that something a surgeon told you? If it is, I don't believe it, not one bit. I've rarely seen cervical instability. It's very uncommon. So what I would say is if you want to know the truth, you need to get an MRI review at Duke Spine Institute, okay? That's the only way you're going to find the truth. I'll tell you if you have cervical instability but most likely you don't. If somebody has told you that, I don't know who told you that, a chiropractor, a neurologist, a neurosurgeon. She Is said neurosurgeon. A neurosurgeon. And how did they determine you have cervical instability? What test did they do? Um, uh, she, yeah, she just said ligament diagnosed from a neurosurgeon. Yeah, I don't trust a lot of neurosurgeons. I'm sorry, that's the God's honest truth. They're not trustworthy. Not even just neurosurgeons, just doctors in general. Um, they either are ignorant in many times and they don't know, which still doesn't, doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means they don't know. And the other reason is they do know and they lie to patients. So she, I personally don't trust them. She said CT flex ion. So what did you see on the CT? Is there four millimeters of slippage at one disc? Flex, uh, uh, flexion and extension on a CT. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, if I'll, I'll be honest with you, if a neurosurgeon is using a CT scan for flexion extension, they're really grasping at straws. Um, it sounds like they're just trying to justify it to the insurance company to do your surgery. I mean, I've never heard of a CT flexion extension. I'm trained at one of the top trauma centers in the country. Sure, it exists, I get it, but it's, if you're doing a flexion extension CT, 
I mean, you're not doing a standard type of treat, uh, diagnostic test. I'm sorry. You're really looking for something. It's hard. Um, you know, your choice, I don't think you necessarily have it. If you can see instability on an x-ray with flexion extension is all you should ne need, then you have instability. You should have four millimeters or more of slippage of one bone on the other. On, but if you're having to get a CT scan to look for that, that means you're really sh like, you, you know, I don't know how to say it. Um, what's the right word, Henry? Uh, good question. Huh? That was a good question. You're really stretching it, <laughs> right? Overreaching, overreaching. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, not trying to be, I don't even know who your neurosurgeon is. You don't have to tell me their name. I don't want to know. I'm just telling you, I don't think you have instability. I think you have probably pain or radicular symptoms or even myelopathy, which is spinal cord dysfunction, but it can usually be fixed with this laser surgery and you don't need fusion, okay? I will tell you this, I see a lot of chiropractors who order these weird tests that nobody else orders to show patients weird things and try to justify treatments that are ex expensive that don't work. And, and I'm not trying to pick on chiropractors, but I'm using that as an example. And there are also surgeons that order weird tests that nobody else orders, like flexion extension CT scans, to look for a diagnosis to justify to you and the insurance company to do an invasive surgery like fusion. Happens all the time. Happening more and more common. So I still don't trust that neurosurgeon or their test. If you show me your flexion extension CT and I see gross instability, then I would agree with them. But like I said, you can see gross instability on an x-ray, so why go through an, a CT scan? CT scans give you probably 10 times more radiation than an x-ray does. And x-ray is the standard to look for instability, flexion extension x-ray. So why wasn't it seen on the flexion extension x-ray? That's the real question, you know? I'm not trying to confuse you. I just want you to be um, in the know because it's your body that's about to undergo a massive surgery that could potentially be unnecessary. All right, we are done with um, three, four, four, five. And we're gonna go down to five, one at the bottom of the spine here on the left. What allergies does he have? I like none. That's good. Good answer. All right. So now why am I not using an AP and a lateral view all the time? Because I use the AP and lateral view to place the needles. That was the most important step. Let's give it a second. Then we'll take that off when we're ready. Um, once you've placed the spinal needle properly, and you get the guide wire down the middle, you take the spinal needle out, you bring your dilator in, you know that that guide wire is safe. As long as you didn't accidentally pull it out when you weren't like paying attention. Surgeons do that sometimes. They accidentally move things um, or somebody else on the, in the OR will accidentally move it, which is why I'm always watching to make sure nothing weird has happened. So as long as the needle stays in place and the guide wire follows the needle, then you don't need two views to place the dilator. Now I probably will use two views now because I'm not in the disc and I'm gonna have to guesstimate where the disc is. All right, you see we got an orbital thing there, um, Jordan. Look at the facet joint at, at S1 and L5. Look up there. I think it's off by one degree on orbit. I think that's maybe worse. I'm not sure. Let's try to fix that shot. He may have moved a little bit. That looks, I don't know. I can't really tell. Is that worse? That looks worse, right? That looks worse. So right now we're setting up the x-ray. That may be, yeah, we need a, the bed up just a slight bit. The other up. That's good. Shot. That looks pretty good there. All right, that's probably as good as we're going to get it. So are you ready? 
All right, move your hand. Let's take that off. Let's just see how we're doing. Take it off. Looks good. Coming out with this needle. Now remember, this is the disc, and you got to hold the guide wire. You can't pull it out. Every little detail of what I do is very important to do. Replicate when you do these surgeries. Otherwise, you can have some serious problems. All right, shot. So I'm holding the guide wire in place at the tip by putting pressure down on the guide wire, but not flexing it or bending it. And I'm coming down this guide wire with a dilator. You can see that shot. <clears throat> now, right where the tip of the dilator is, Jordan, we show them, that's where the facets are. There's two of them. There's a left and a right. You can see them. And they're sclerotic. They're, they're dark, which means that they're thick, and thicker than normal, because the other ones are not thick. But the S1, L5 facets are thick. All right, so I'm going past it right now. And remember, it was pushing me laterally. I didn't want to go lateral. I want to go more medial. But it forced me lateral. Shot? So now i got to come in carefully just under the nerve root, the L5 nerve root. And I'm going to aim medially to try to regain ground. That's looking really good. Let's get an AP view. Any more questions, feel free to type them up. We've got about another 30 minutes or so with this case. Let me have, hold on, do you have a coker? No? Just don't take that x-ray yet, I wanna move my hand. Anyway, um, for the question that was earlier with a CAT scan, CAT scans are dangerous, folks. I don't, oh, that's beautiful. I don't order CAT scans unless we're looking for, looking for failed fusion or hardware loosening. I mean, it's rare to need a CAT scan, but you certainly don't order a flexion extension CAT scan. I mean, my God, I've never ordered one of those. It's totally unnecessary, in my opinion, okay? So take it with a grain of salt. That's just my opinion. But I've practiced now 26 years without a flexion extension CAT scan. There's no need for it. John? Ay, cabrón. I'm not happy with that. Why? Huh? Yeah. I'm going to have to come back. Yeah, sometimes we're not able to do certain discs because the patient's anatomy shot. It's rare, but it does happen. And uh, the more we do these surgeries, the more common it's going to get. Um, shot. So again, he, you can't appreciate it on your view. Can we get a better picture? And maybe stop pulsing. Try to line up those, those, um, those, the end plate a little bit better, not orbit. I'm talking about wag. Shot. Nope, it's worse. Yeah, the, is that, that, that's, I think, a little better. Can you give me a better picture? It's just too over-penetrated. But otherwise, it looks like the alignment is good. Ah, way too over-penetrated. No, no, tone it down. It's too, too light. Can't see. I need to see. Oh, man, please help me. Is this where that new floor will be better? That's better. But I think your, your end plate is not lined up. You see the end plate right there? It, I'm not sure if it's lined up. I think we need to do something with the wag. Not a lot, but try something and see what happens. That's better. That's definitely better. All right. So once again, I need to redirect this thing and aim it up a little bit shot that's where i'm aiming right now so i'm having to really pull down hard against this hip shot Whew, i think we're in all right no 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 no, no. let's do our di uh, die let's do our pipe cleaner so we're going to try to shoot a discogram just to verify we're in the disc, plus to get some of the 
Duke Spine Special Blue in there. Any questions? No current Scott? questions. So surgery, in case you haven't noticed, is one of those things where you try to do it exactly the same way for everybody, but the reality is, is people are different with their anatomy and their physiology. Shot, let's see what we got. Shot, nice, we're in the disc, that's beautiful. We just did our discogram, shot, that's pretty. All right, good. Eh, it's not the ideal situation, but it's, it's as good as we can get it. So if you notice what I had to do, okay, was the facet joint was forcing my needle to go south when I got to the disc. I didn't want to go south. I didn't want to go towards the feet. I wanted to be more north. So I literally had to get the dilator down there, and I had to pull the top of the dilator south to cause the tip to go north and leverage it against the hip, right, like a seesaw. You know, if you pull down on one side of the seesaw, the other side goes up. And that's what I did. And I was able to get into the disc. And I'm only able to do that because I have the greatest anesthesiologist and the greatest help here in the OR with Luis and my team, my entire team here. So again, you know, you have to improvise sometimes in life, especially even in surgery, you have to improvise. That should be good. We've got our tube in place. Let's get a shot. Yeah, it looks good. Go ahead and take that out. All right, we've had some good questions and comments today. Anybody else have questions or comments? Shot? Yep, that's good. No current questions. All right, for those of you who don't know, Duke Spine has an app. It's free. All right, it's $1 million. You can download the app on your iPhone or your Android. And by the way, I heard there's a Tesla phone coming out very soon. So I'm sure they're going to have apps as well. Anybody getting the Tesla phone? You're not? Didn't even you know, know that was a thing. I have an iPhone and I, listen, I, it's funny. I have an iPhone. I was searching Tesla phone the other night on my iPhone. They gave me horrible results. Like you couldn't really see anything. <laughs> it was very confusing. That's it's funny. literally hiding the results on Safari. That's what I mean by social media really does. They really do control content, even on search. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, it's crazy, huh? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if you have an iPhone, go try searching Tesla phone. See what kind of websites and data you actually get. It's really not, yeah. at least right now, it's not very easy to understand. All right. I intend to get that. That I, a Tesla phone. My wife is a diehard iPhone lover. But honestly, I just hate some of the things about the iPhone. Specifically, this programmed obsolescence more bothers me more than anything. You know? Can you imagine if I did surgeries that were programmed by me to last only two years and then people had to come back again? I make a killing, right? But it's unethical. Extorting money from people is unethical. But not unethical for the iPhone for some reason or for Microsoft. You know, they're always requiring you to buy a new version of their uh, software. Huh? They do it with cars. No, don't you know that? My, fa my father-in-law is an a auto mechanic. And in the old days, he could work on any car. But now with all the computer chips, he's not able to work on the cars. They all have to go to a dealer. You have to have a s license from a dealer in order to work on a car nowadays. So that's why he, one of the reasons he retired. There's, you know, the old cars, there's no more old cars on the roads. So everyone has these new cars with chips. And the dealers, you're forced to take the car to the dealer because they have the... Uh, computer system to analyze what's wrong. You know, they, they, they pack it up and sell it to you. Like, imagine if I made a, a, a horse shit burger, right? Do you want to eat a horse shit burger? 
Oh, let's just say cow shit, cow patty, all right? I'm selling cow patty burgers, okay? Would you eat a cow patty burger? No. Would you buy one from me? No. All right, but I'm going to tell you it's wonderful for your diet. You know, it's low calorie. There's no cholesterol. And it's high in fiber. Um, it's great for weight loss, right? So I'm selling it. But in the end, it's still a cow shit burger, a cow patty burger. But that's what these guys do. Microsoft will say, oh, we have updates, you know. You need to buy the newest operating system. It's wonderful. We got more antivirus. Yeah, but it still sucks, and we shouldn't have to do that. You know, things should be built to last forever like they used to be. Unfortunately, there's this greed, there's this economic stimulation ideology that has just taken over. The discs are less sensate, huh? All right. How could you possibly feel his discs? I'm joking with you. All right. Yes, I am. Huh? Did you change the local dosage? I think Luis has really pumped it up. I think you got rid of it. Yeah, it could be. But the reality is I just injected this disc a few minutes ago. And I, I'm just, I know, but I think it's the individual because I just didn't even do a discogram at this level. Normally when you're doing this, it goes up like 10. Really? Well, I can tell you this is a very scarred disc, L5S1. Look at all the scar tissue here. I'm trying to find the, uh, the pain generators, which is going to be the tear, but it's so scarred up. I'm working my way there. Any questions? No current questions. All right. What are your thoughts, Henry? You like programmed obsolescence? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You like having to buy a new phone every year? Uh, I, well, I just recently bought the 13, and, like, apparently the 14's coming out, not that, uh... Huh? Oh, uh, I just, uh, purchased the 13 not too long ago, and now the 14's coming out for the iPhone? Yeah. And I just find that ridiculous. <laughs> so you actually like having to buy a new phone, being forced by the company to upgrade and... No, and the thing is, is with the uh, chips and all, they can design them to make them last longer. They just choose not to, so know, for them that's to sell. What I'm saying. Yeah. So you don't like programmed obsolescence either? No, not really, no. Does anybody here like programmed obsolescence? I mean, maybe if you own stock in Microsoft or Apple, you like it, but how about the rest of us that are trying to make a living, trying to get by? You know, we don't want to have to keep buying phones. Yeah, you know, they already have the design for the iPhone 28 and every version before that. They already have it locked in a vault. But they're slowly releasing all these upgrades because they want to milk people for their money. But why are consumers accepting this nonsense? Why aren't we doing something about it? Because it's the new and now. I guess I that'd be my assumption. Same thing with the cars, though. Yeah. You know, you can't just take your car to an independent mechanic anymore and get it fixed. You got to go to a certified mechanic, someone who's basically paying money to the company to have that software in order to check your car out. Yes, in case you haven't figured it out, I am an idealist. I'm sorry to inconvenience you guys with that for those who don't like it, but c'est la vie, as they say in French. Any other news that we should be talking about since we don't have any questions? Mm -hmm. Any news on the launch? On That's the happening launch? Saturday. All right, we have a launch Saturday. SpaceX? Sp uh, NASA. Artemis. Artemis. Yeah. Very good. All right, any questions from our audience? No current questions. Let's go ahead and run one of our patient testimonials.
you see the vein right there? It's on the bottom of the nerve root. I'm just below it. That herniation right there was pushing on it. I'm Dr. Arjit Majin here at the Duke Spine Institute with one of my patients who's traveled from North Carolina. Uh, because he had some herniated discs in his lower back and he was having problems with the back. What kind of problems brought you to Duke Spine Institute? Dr. Duke, it was severe pain, pain that I had never experienced before and pain that scared me so much that I thought it was going to change the way I lived. I, I've got a family and I'm active and it literally scared me to death. And as I'm talking to you right now, the hair standing up on my neck, the, the pain that I was suffering and where I thought I was, I didn't think there was gonna be an answer. And you were pretty much bedridden. You couldn't get out of bed. I remember you showed up here in a wheelchair because any standing was causing sciatic type pain in your leg. Yeah, there was no doubt. And that's not an over uh, exaggeration where I could maybe get up, for, uh, like stand for 15, 20 seconds so I could get to the bathroom to go urinate, for instance. But then when I got there, I had to lay on the floor so I could rest up a little bit so I could stand with pain to even be able to try to urinate. And this went on for two, two and a half weeks. It was absolutely brutal. And there was no respite. Pain that I have had in the past, I could find some position where there was some respite from the pain and there was nothing. So your wife is a physician. Uh, was she able to fix your back problem for you? I wish. No, I mean, she, you know, she consoled me. And in the town that we come from, we know a lot of folks. And um, to be absolutely honest, we just weren't getting a lot of help. And like I said, um, we know a lot of folks and it was prolonged and we were talking about pain management and, and all that. And it, it, that's just not for me. And uh, like I said, I was scared to death. The problem with pain management, unfortunately, is that it doesn't fix the issue when you have a herniated disc yeah. and back pain from a herniated disc because you need surgery on that disc to repair it. That's what the Duke Laser Disc Repair did. And you can actually see here that we went into his disc with the endoscope and we were cleaning out the herniation with the laser. Yeah. And the laser actually makes a huge difference. People say, oh, lasers, they're not used in, in spine surgery, but they are. And they're very, very powerful tools and very precise. So we were able to clean out your discs, remove the herniation, and how do you feel today? I feel great. I mean, uh, it's probably, I mean, I know I'm on camera right here, but I literally could not walk into the office yesterday yesterday and I'll just I don't mean you're gonna see my shorts and everything you have to edit yeah, whatever go. but I'm able to walk that's awesome and yeah, I, and I'm, I'm just it wasn't even close I was actually and I'm it's I, I don't know if you can tell from the camera that what my personality is but I'm a I, I try to be very polite and I was apologizing for profusely sweating because I hurt so bad it's not because of the Florida heat by any means it's because I hurt so bad I never experienced pain like that. And like I said, there's because no Because you're, you're a redneck too, you know? You're <laughs> yeah. not that far from Florida. That's you're right. Just, uh, That's just right. up a state or two, right? That's right, yeah. A couple of states. So you're feeling better today. It's been less than 24 hours since yep. we did your surgery. You went home an hour after the surgery, back to your hotel with yep. your lovely family who I met. Yep. And uh, how do they feel about your progress? They're happy that I'm happy. You know what I mean? Because they were scared too. You know, now they were putting on strong a strong front, but I really, I am just telling you, I was at my wits end. And I certainly are a lot more appreciative of people who have pain that I'm aware of because when there's no rest from it, oh my gosh, you know what I mean? I was really at my wits end and you saved me. So I appreciate you very much. You are welcome, sir. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say to your fans out there? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, I could have pretty up for you a little bit better. So just had surgery yesterday. All right. Cut me some slack. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and you're heading back home today, correct? Yeah, we're going back on the plane later, so later this evening. The kids are going to swim a little bit down here in Melbourne. I am just going to rest and watch TV, but then we're going to get on a plane a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, congratulations. Yeah. You had faith. Yes. You took the leap and you got the surgery done. Yes, sir. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Welcome back, folks. I hope you enjoyed the 
patient testimonial. Just so you know, all those testimonials are, we don't pay any of those people. Those are real patients who had surgery. They volunteered to do the testimonials themselves out of the kindness of their hearts, wanting to share their story. Um, all of them basically paid for the surgery and they're very happy. Um, and we appreciate the fact they're willing to share their experience with others. That's how you spread the message about what's available to cure back and neck pain. All right, we're putting the dilator and now we're going over the dilator with the tube. The tubular retractor is what it's called. And by the way, in a percutaneous laser disc discectomy, which is not what we do here, they don't put a tubular retractor. They use a needle and they don't make an incision, they use a needle. So people ask me, what's the difference? There's a lot of differences, but that's just two of them. Also, our surgery, remember, is the Duke Laser Disc Repair. It's its own procedure. It's been peer reviewed and published. And it has things that I do during the surgery that no one else does unless they're doing a Duke Laser Disc Repair, which they're not because they'd have to get trained by me to do it. So far, everything's going well for this patient. We've lost about eight cc's of blood. Now, if he had a open back surgery, he, we would have lost, uh, not us, but other surgeons could have lost 800 cc's of blood, about 100 times as much bleeding. Without this Duke laser disc repair, this patient would have their surgery in the hospital. The hospitals are dangerous places right now for surgery because that's where infected infections are. That's where complications happen in hospitals. We've done this surgery now for 16 years. We've not had a single surgical complication. No nerve damage, no spinal fluid leak, no organ injuries, uh, no infections. No hospital, uh, return to hospitals. We did have one patient who we did have to take to the hospital. That was more of an anesthesia and cardiac issue. Not Dr. Bernda's, of course. But here we are. Um, at almost finished. We have just two more discs to repair and is that the same two discs we repaired on the patient's left side. Now we're repairing them on the right side. Any more questions from our audience no, at this time? No current questions. All right. Well, let's go ahead and show the latecomers exactly why do herniated discs cause back pain to begin with? How does that work? And how do they cause leg pain? The answer, folks, is inflammation. It's an inflammatory disease. Herniated discs and ruptured discs, protruding discs is an inflammatory disease. A lot of doctors don't know that. Neurosurgeons don't know that. They think herniated discs cause symptoms by pressure. It's, it's uh, compression. Therefore, all the surgeries you hear about are decompressive, decompressive, decompressive. Decompressive laminectomy, decompressive discectomy, decompressive microdiscectomy. Everything is about decompression. But the truth is, is that all of these back conditions and neck conditions, almost all of them, not all of them, but 95% are about inflammation. And that's why so many surgeons fail to fix people, is that they're not focused on the inflammatory component of the disease. They're focused on the structural compression component of the disease, not the physiological component. Basic mistake, and I, I learned from those same surgeons. I was misled in the beginning by them, and then I discovered the truth myself and it, only, it always makes sense, by the way. The truth always makes sense. 
That's how you know it's the truth, because it follows laws, physical laws of our universe. Specifically, this is an inflammatory condition. So go ahead and run the video, and let's show our viewers why discs cause, herniated discs cause pain. Traumatic injury to the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissues develop within the annular tear causing back pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause symptoms to worsen. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to nearby nerve roots, causing leg pain. Signals travel up nerves to the brain, causing localized back pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. All right, welcome back. See the laser here at 12 o'clock moving up and down? That is the tear right there. That's what we're after. We want to debride that tear, get rid of the nucleus propulsus that's stuck in it, causing all the inflammation. So you saw that tear on the animation just a minute ago. Now you're seeing it in real life. That should make sense, hopefully, to you. See the tear? So yeah. on the right side is the bone. On the left side is the bone. It's called the vertebral body, end plate specifically. And between it is this herniation stuck inside the tear. And that's what we clean with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. We remove it. And we're the, I'm the first surgeon in the world, the first person in the world to describe this. And we did it in a publication. And why am I saying this? Well, I'm saying it for a reason, not because I like to toot my own horn. I'm saying it because I want you guys to understand you're not going to find this anywhere else. So if you go to other surgeons and say, why don't you do a debridement, an annular debridement, they're gonna, you gotta push more. They're gonna look at you funny and say, what are you talking about? Because they don't know what we're talking about. Yes, it's been peer reviewed and published. It's been presented at national meetings, but surgeons, they don't pay attention. I have had surgeons come to me saying, after their training and residency, I say to them, I'll teach you how to do the surgeries right the right way for the patients so they have great results and they say to me, I already know how to do surgery, I don't need you to teach me anything. So there's this pervasive attitude by surgeons, their arrogance has prevented them from learning alternative ways of treating patients that could be better than what they're doing. And what they're learning is fusion surgery and their residencies, yeah, that was better. And uh, fusion surgeries they're learning to do are what they're being taught to do by the implant companies and the representatives of the implant companies, okay? The implant companies are the companies that make billions of dollars a year selling screws and rods for your spine or metal plates and cages or artificial discs. Those companies get paid every time a surgeon puts a piece of metal in someone's body and leaves it there. It's called an implant or a biological, which is the, which is the, um, the DBM, demineralized bone matrix or BMP. The point is you are the recipient of that implant, you the patient. The only reason to put that implant in you today is to make money for the companies and the surgeon, not for your benefit. And that's 98% of the time. The rest of the time, I mean 98% of the time, you can have your back or neck fixed without the implants by doing this surgery right here, endoscopic Duke laser disc repair. But of course, the implant companies don't want you to stop receiving their implants. That's like a bar, right? What does a bar want? They want people to come in and get drunk. 
on their beer and their alcohol. Why? Because that's how they make their money. Okay, our culture, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, opposed to alcohol consumption, you know, but I'm opposed to excessive alcohol consumption. And your, your idea of excessive and my idea of excessive probably are different. But and your idea of excessive is different than everybody else's. So it's shared understandings that, that allow us to relate to people. But what I'm saying is the bar is perfectly happy to have you come in there and drink as much alcohol as you can drink every day because they're making money off you buying alcohol. Now, some of you may or may not want to believe me, and that's your choice, but alcohol is 100% poison to your body. It's toxic. Everybody learns that in medical school. Every single doctor knows that alcohol is toxic, okay? Now, the, the idea is that if you have small amounts, like very small amounts, you know, you can avoid the toxicity or you can minimize the effects of toxic and you can have this other effect where it kind of impairs the function of cells like your neurons so that they don't function normally and you kind of have a buzz. And that's what people want, right? Or they want to drink socially and have a buzz. So the point is, is that the bar is happy to keep giving you alcohol until it becomes toxic to you and hurts you. They don't, they don't care because you to, to them, you're just a piece of meat with money, bringing your money to them, and that, that's what they want. They want your money. And by the way, these implant companies see you the same way. You're a piece of meat with money to them. That's how the spine surgeons see you, and that's how the implant companies see you, okay? They don't want to change what they're doing because they're making so much money off putting metal in people. But you, the person who's getting the metal, should know better. You should know that you don't have to have metal. You don't need an artificial disc or a fusion done because it's unnecessary now, okay? And by, by the way, nobody is going to protect you and your meat from becoming the receiver of metal but you. Be you, personally you. You have to stand up for yourself. You understand what I'm saying? I hate to say it, but who protected the Jews being led to a gas chamber, who, who stood up for them? Nobody, all right? And the same thing's happening right now. Of course, not to the same extent. I wanna be politically correct. But if you don't stand up for yourself, no one is coming to save you. All I'm doing is making you aware of the problem, okay? But I can't save all of you from these doctors. Only you can save yourselves from these screws and rods and cages that are unnecessary, that are harmful, that are dangerous. Now, there was a time when they were necessary, okay, when that was the best we had. And it works. It works well in most cases as long as it's done properly. I've even published my results on fusions. But when I learned the laser endoscopic surgery and I realized I could fix people without metal, without implants, without biologicals, I realized, my God, all those fusions and metals and artificial discs are completely unnecessary because uh, we have some water on the floor just because we can get rid of patient symptoms and fix them even better without metal, without open surgery. So yes, my message is harsh, it's stern, it's unpleasant, maybe you don't wanna hear it, but this is my channel and I'm gonna share what I know with you guys. Because after all, I, my best interest is making, making sure you guys are well cared for and safe. That's what I want as a doctor. My job is to take care of patients and make them better in the least invasive way possible, the safest way possible. So I feel like I'm doing my job by informing you all of this problem. All right. Well, that's what happens when you don't ask questions. I go off a little bit on tangents. So rein me back in. You can see we've gotten rid of the herniation. There's a little bit of pinkness or inflammation. That will go away now that we've gotten rid of the herniation and we've debrided the annular tear. Unfortunately, 
when people do wrong things in life, many times they do it unknowing that they're doing something wrong. Sometimes they're brainwashed to believe what they're doing is right. But that's why you got to think for yourself and not let other people brainwash you. Okay, it's dangerous when, when people don't think for themselves and they just trust those around them to make decisions that are best for them. I can tell you right now, I've learned that that's not always going to happen. There are some good people, there's not a lot. And those good people will tell you and do what's best for you, not just what's best for themselves. Unfortunately, the United States is rife with examples of corruption and greed. Why do you think Obama shut NASA down? Obama shut NASA down because of all the waste, all the greed and corruption in the space industrial complex. Look, I'm not a big Obama fan by any means, but, um, you know, <clears throat> scope off. The fact, the fact is that there was tremendous amount of wasted money going on with uh, the space program in the United States. I mean, you hear the stories about how we pay, you know, thousands of dollars for a roll of toilet paper, you know, to companies like Halliburton that make, they make trillions of dollars on war off the American public. And we just keep going deeper into debt, okay? So my point is you cannot expect those people that you trust to be trustworthy you have to hold them accountable. You have to monitor them and check on them. And um, hold them accountable. So, all right. That's good. We have one more disc to do. Any questions from our audience? No current questions. Great. Well, if you're watching and you want to ask a question, uh, where's my ray tech for my wrist? Feel free to type up your question. We're broadcasting these surgeries live on the day of surgery in Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and maybe one more platform. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and both our YouTube channels. Pressure. Should we? You're starting to make old wives tales. Urban legends. Look at that. Interesting, huh? I'm sorry? Come on, Jordan, I need you to find it. Let's go. Hold this, please. Hold this, please. Luis, hold this. All right. Um, I mean, come on. I got to see more than that. You're way too zoomed in. Okay, let's just hold pressure. Let's uh, give us a second while we get the... All right, thank you. Uh, did you show her what to do there, Jordan? So she can do it next time herself. But let her let her know what to do, so she can do it next time. Can you show her real quick? Oh, you did. All right, good. Thanks. Yeah. When you discover something, share the knowledge with those around you, so we can all benefit. Shot. All right, we've got probably 15 minutes left in the surgery. We have one disc left to do. This is the right L34, right L34. This disc was a 10 out of 10 pain for this patient. John? Let's give some more num num. Per Dr. Berndez's request. Now that we're inside the annulus. 
Thanks. Oh, I should have held it in. <clears throat> we were having some fun the other day with uh, one of my, a couple of my old faculty from University of Florida in Gainesville, one of them being Dr. Albert Roten, the other one being Dr. Arthur Day. And <clears throat> as a resident in neurosurgery, your life is pretty limited. You live in the hospital pretty much every day. And basically, um, you, you get really close to each other. You get close to your attendings. Attendings being the faculty, the professors. And one of the things we, we do as residents is we imitate our faculty because they're always lecturing to us. So we'll sit in the back and kind of smirk at some of their, the way they talk, their mannerisms and their, their speech. Yeah, we need to pull it back a little bit. So we were talking about Dr. Art Day. Did you get it? Uh huh. We were talking about Dr. Arthur Day, who was um, our cerebrovascular neurosurgeon at Chance for many years. Sean? And no. Sean? Yeah, we're gonna can't go any further. It must be a piece of tissue or something. We're just gonna have to pull it back. You getting it? Yes. Good job. Luis, you are the man. The man with the plan. No, we're good. Take, take it out. So Dr. Day had some very funny expressions. You know, when you're operating on someone's brain and it's life or death and literally every move you make can, kill, can result in the death of the patient or permanent stroke or loss of life. I mean, this is really intense surgery. And at times when things weren't going well, he would have a famous saying, which we all, we all talked about and we all kind of made fun of him. Um, so if things were going bad in the operating room, he, he would have the residents helping him. And one of the things he would say all the time was, help me, help me. I know you can't help me, but damn it, try. <laughs> so very funny. I know you can't do it, but try anyway. I want to see you try. Now, of course, I love Dr. Day. Everybody I worked with, I really have a lot of respect for, except for one person. <laughs> you guys know his name? Let me see if my staff know who I'm talking about. Pat Jacob. Pat Jacob, one of the lowest forms of human existence. Honestly, I think they found his relatives on Mars last week. They were crawling around in the Martian soil. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't too long ago they discovered other relatives in the sewers of New York. Anyway, Dr. Jacob is just one of the worst human beings alive. I tell stories over the years while I broadcast just to remind people. He was so bad he couldn't even be successful in private practice. And he's got some skills. He's not an unskilled surgeon, but his personality is so malicious and malignant. He actually goes out of his way to hurt people emotionally, uh, psychologically, torture the residents. He was universally hated by everyone. There's nothing wrong with being demanding. I'm demanding. As long as what you're demanding of people is to do a good job so that the patient is rewarded with a great surgery and a great outcome, nobody will ever convince me otherwise. But that's not what Dr. Jacob was all about. He was about just, just being mean. You know, there are people who just are mean people for no other reason but to be mean and hurt people's feelings. And that's what Dr. Jacob was. He was so hated that when he worked at the VA hospital in Gainesville, 
that um, we, we had this situation I'd never seen because I was there for seven years. I've told this story before, but I was coming to the hospital to do surgery with the other residents and there were police running around with, with rifles, AR-15s, literally with a uh, SWAT team. And I, we said, what's going on? They said, there's a shooter in the building, in the hospital. This is the VA hospital in Gainesville. You guys better take cover, hide somewhere. So we said, okay, hid. Later on comes to find out that the shooter was actually a patient of the hospital who was actually a patient of Dr. Jacob. <laughs> who Dr. Jacob was so offensive to the patient that the guy came back, or one of our veterans of war, came back with a gun looking for Dr. Jacob. All right, now listen, I'm not the nicest person in the world at times either. I probably have some people who think low of me, but the reality is, is these guys were looking for Pat because he's such an asshole. I'm sure there are a few residents who felt the same way. Anyway, that's the only time I had ever seen the entire VA on lockdown. And I got to be honest with you, I thought I'd never see it happen again. But lo and behold, my senior year, my chief year, it happened again. SWAT teams running around the hospital looking for some active shooter. And lo and behold, again, it was Dr. Jacob's patient. They were looking for Dr. Jacob once again, another patient, not the same one. Yeah, he was Mr. Marvelous, let me tell you. He will always be remembered, even when he's gone, as being that person, that guy. Not just by me, but by all the residents. I will memorialize him. Yeah, that's him. So that's an old picture, by the way, because it looks a lot worse now. He looks like a red-headed stepchild that you want to beat. Almost done, my friend. You're going to get a kick out of this dialogue, I'm sure. You're doing great. I think, I think our patient's gonna do fantastic. I'm seeing a lot of um, inflammatory tissue and we're getting it all cleaned out. Is that you? Oh, I thought there was something sparking or something. It was just your pen. You freaked me out. I don't like noises that I'm not accustomed to hearing. That's all right. Um, but what I was getting at is, I, at every one of these discs, we're seeing a huge tear, lots of interposed nucleus propulsus causing inflammation. That's the source of his pain. I feel really encouraged, because in the beginning, if you go back, you'll see that we did the discogram on him, and he actually knew we were gonna do a discogram. I said, you know what comes next? And he said, yeah. Uh, he's watched 20 of these surgeries of mine before he came here, 20. So, you know, he is a veteran himself, um, with respect to knowledge of the surgery. What does that tell you? Someone who suffered for 40 years in back pain has been three operations before he got to me over the years. All of them have resulted in him being worse, basically. Uh, he's progressively gotten worse over the years. And he found us. He watched my surgeries and he's a believer. And I think he's gonna do fantastic. I'm really excited for him and his wife. The only thing I, I have remorse for is that he had to suffer for 40 years. Nobody should have to suffer, let alone for 40 years before they get fixed medically from a, a problem that is totally curable nowadays, which is discogenic back pain. The back pain coming from an annular tear, degenerated disc, herniated disc, bulging disc, ruptured disc, discogenic back pain. Just for those of you who don't know, genesis means the beginning or it means the origin. And discogenic means that the back pain is originating or its origin is the disc. Now that's different than facetogenic back pain. Facetogenic back pain is back pain coming from a facet joint. Which by the way, yesterday I saw a Duke plasma rhizotomy patient who had facet pain in his thoracic and we did his 
plasma rhizotomy last week. He's a week out of surgery. 100% of the pain is gone. He's smiling and laughing and happy. And uh, he's playing golf. When my staff told me your patient's here one week after surgery and he's playing golf, and I said, oh my God, he's not supposed to play golf because I thought he's a, a laser surgery on his disc, but he wasn't. He was a facet joint treatment, which is you can go back to golfing right away. And um, yeah, he was really, really happy. He's gonna do a testimonial for us next week. I mean, not next week, in five weeks when he comes back at his six week follow-up. He didn't wanna do it yesterday because he, was, he wants to dress up. He was wearing a t-shirt and short gym shorts yesterday just one week after his plasma rhizotomy. He's from uh, Titusville, okay. but you know, originally a lot of these people are from the Northeast and, um, but he's living in a, we're, we're low on, on uh, irrigation, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm getting too much debris in the field. Anyway, the patient, thank you. The patient uh, lives about 30 minutes, so he's local came in for his post-op check and a week later and he had all of his pain was gone. Again, he didn't have a disc pain, he had facet pain. We've talked about this before. If the pain isn't coming from the disc, that's a herniation by the way, then it's coming from the facet usually. Just about done. 30 seconds, doctor. 30 seconds and we'll be done. Uh, by the way, if you notice, I'm going back and forth from the uh, middle, mid, middle area to the side, making sure I get all the herniation and all the annular debridement done. I don't want to leave anything and have to come back. Never had to come back unless people rupture their, re-rupture their disc. But, um, yeah, all right. We have a question. All right, just give me a second uh, and I'll take the question. I'm thinking I should take it live. So why don't we save it and I'll come over there and we'll take it live. Is that okay? Copy that. Yeah, folks, go ahead and type up your questions. I'll take them live in about five minutes. And that way you can, you and I can have a talk live rather than uh, this way, because I'm just about done. Why don't we go ahead and I'm gonna show you guys the incision. There's a piece of herniation coming out. And then we're gonna, put our um, stereo strips and Band-Aid on while I come over there to talk to you guys and answer your questions. So feel free to type them up. A um, lot of inflammatory tissue right there. You guys see that? Remember, this is an inflammatory disease. So a lot of inflammation, a lot of blood vessels, scar tissue um, that you're gonna see in the area of the painful disc because, well, that's where the pain's coming from. All right, here you go, we're done. All right, let's show the audience. Can you see this here? I need, I need the, yeah, lay still, you, come on, come on, hurry up. What are you doing, man, you're too slow. We're just gonna put some band-aids on, you gotta stay still. I'm gonna show you guys the incision in just a second. How's he doing? Is, is his shoulder okay? He's doing great. So that stuff we use is an antiseptic, by the way. We call it, it's called betadine. Don't move. Nobody likes having a metal tubular retractor in their back. A little bit of pressure on your back. Yeah, you? just lay still, don't move. Don't move, buddy. All right, so Henry, let's show the audience. This is the incision we used. You see that? Yep. And we got the same thing on the other side. We used two of those seven millimeters. We did the whole surgery through two tiny little Band-Aid incisions. Just to give you an idea, if we were still doing fusions, um, the incision would be this long for him. Can you see this? Yes. That's how long it would be. Easy. 
to do with three discs with cleaning the discs out, cages, uh, screws, and rods. Put pressure here, please. Thank you. All right, I'm going to come answer your questions, so type them up. This was a bilateral Duke Laser disc repair, L34, L45, left L5S1. Let's go ahead and show our audience um, another patient who had the similar surgery, and they can share their experience. This is Dr. Ari Duke Majin, CEO and founder of the Duke Spine Institute. I'm here with one of my patients, and you've traveled from where to the Duke Spine? Idaho. Idaho, with your lovely husband, and we've had a few conversations. She came here to have her back fixed. How long have you had back pain for? For over seven years. Okay. And what kind of work did you do before you retired, if you don't mind me asking? It was desk work. All right. And so you had back pain for seven years. Um, did you have an injury to your back or did it just kind of gradually come on? It just gradually came on. I actually noticed it first in 2015 when I was gardening and I couldn't be up there for eight hours. I was into it for about four hours and I had to take a break. And as time progressed, my breaks got longer and longer and the amount of work I did in the garden was less and less. Understood. And you're retired now. So what's it like having back pain limit your ability to do stuff when you're retired? It, for me, it's very frustrating. I can't do that which what I want to do. Um, so we kept seeking solutions and nothing was working. They did work for a short while, but that short while decreased over time. It was shorter and shorter. My husband does research very, very well. Through his research, he found you. We read that you can fix my back, and you did fix my back. That's right. And I thank you. You're welcome. So when did you have the Duke laser disc repair done and the Duke plasma rhizotomy? I had those done yesterday in the afternoon. I am sitting straighter than I am. I'm standing straighter. I'm walking normal. It's like, wow, I knew me. Look at that smile right there. <laughs> I hadn't seen that until just now. So Well, it wasn't there yesterday. Yeah, it wasn't there before surgery. And how long have you been not smiling because you've been in pain? I mean, really bad pain. How long has the really bad pain been there? This, well, the really bad pain has probably been over the last five years. It's something that was really tough to maintain a positive attitude and try to keep a smile on my face and keep Jeff's hopes up. Um, I tend to be a positive person, but there were times when it does drag you down. Of course, yeah. It's hard living with chronic pain, and especially with loved ones, they have a hard time, you know, relating. Of course, they want to be supportive, and your husband is a very supportive man, obviously. And he's a pleasure to meet. I know he's an author as well. Um, and so what are you going to do now that you've had the surgery? And you could see, actually, the Duke laser disc repair procedure she had done yesterday. You can see... Right here, we went into the discs that were damaged. You had two annular tears. We tested your discs during the surgery and indeed they were causing your pain. So we verified that with our discogram. And then I went ahead and used the laser to clean up the tears that were causing your pain and get rid of that source of pain for you. And here you are, you're doing fantastic. How much of your back pain from before surgery do you still have? Oh, virtually nothing. It's gone. It's gone. Cured. My lower back, it's, I have not been without pain in my lower back until your surgery. It's constant, it's always there. I've never been without it. I'm without it now. <laughs> so are you uh, gonna go back to gardening? You bet I am. <laughs> All right, very good. And what other things would you like to do now that you have a new back that doesn't hurt you anymore? You know, the biggest thing I wanna do I want to go fly a kite. Good for you. <laughs> Let's go fly a kite then. That's right. <laughs> well, congratulations on having faith oh, and being brave you. and getting it done. Oh, yeah. not a problem. Is there anything else you want to say to your fans out there? Um, I highly recommend Dr. Duke's Spine Institute, Dr. Duke personally, to help you fix your back. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
All right, safe travels. Phew, that wasn't too bad, was it? <laughs> it was. It was wonderful. All right, so now you've had the surgery. How are you doing today? I feel awesome. I mean, the only pain is, you know, surgery site pain, and that's okay. it. No nerve pain. So the pain that you had before the surgery is gone. Gone. Cured. Gone. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yes, that's amazing. I'm Dr. R. Duke Majin with the Duke Spine Institute, and I'm here with one of my patients who just had the Duke laser disc repair on her lower back, and she wants to share her story with you. Now, you came to Duke Spine Institute because you were having back and left leg pain for how mm -hmm. long? Uh, well, that the terrible left leg pain probably about two years, but prior, I mean, I've had issues since I was 14 years old, so it's been a lot of roller coaster pain since then. So you've had back pain since you were 14. You're clearly not 14 anymore. No. <laughs> and so that's like 15, 20 years, right? Yeah, too long. And so why didn't you get it fixed sooner? Well, the doctors when I was younger didn't want to operate. They wanted to, you know, I was young. They didn't want to take a chance because the, all the surgeries then at that point, there was just nothing there that could, that wasn't going to be traumatic to my back and my spine. So I went through physical therapy shots, um, decompression they did that and nothing was really working and then it eventually kind of got better and then it would get worse and it would get better and it was just up and down up and down up and down and the reason it got better was the inflammation from the injury to your disc started to get better yeah but then you'd have another herniation with activity and then it made it worse so yeah. when we were in there and you can see from this video right here that we were pulling out lots of big fragments of disc herniation you probably over your lifetime from 14 until now had at least 10, 20 different episodes of herniation. And that's what we saw when we were inside there. Mm -hmm. All right, so now you've had the surgery. How are you doing today? I feel awesome. I mean, the only pain is, you know, surgery site pain and that's okay. it, no nerve pain. So the pain that you had before the surgery is? Gone. Gone, cured. Gone, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yes, that's amazing. <laughs> Now, you're not from Florida. No, I'm from Ohio. So you traveled <laughs> from Ohio to the Duke Spine Institute in Florida. Why did you come all the way down to Florida? There was nobody near us or anywhere near us that had any other option besides either getting a discectomy or a laminectomy or a fusion. There was just no other, nobody was doing anything else. And I knew I didn't want to do that again because I'd already had that done. So it didn't work. <laughs> and, didn't work. Uh, I had a really amazing physical therapist that connected me with you and the rest is history. Yeah, your yeah. physical therapist found us and, mm -hmm. and was intrigued with the surgeries we're doing here yeah. and sent you here. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to tell your physical therapist, uh, I call him <laughs> Dr. Salinas, what are you going to tell him when you... Oh man, I mean I've already told him. I texted him the minute I got back to our Airbnb, I said, I feel amazing and I can't wait to tell all the rest of the patients in our Facebook group. like. This works, so. It does, the Duke laser disc repair really does work. Mm. Well, is there anything else you wanna to say to your fans out there or friends? <laughs> my fans and my friends. Um, thank you for praying. Thank you for, uh, you know, believing me. I think it, that's one of the biggest things. There's a stigma around back pain because you can't see it, that people are just faking it or maybe they're babies. Like, why can't you just deal with the pain? And it's it overwhelms you and so to come someplace that believes me and then fixes the problem and now I'm sitting here and I can be like a fully active mom so I'm just beyond thankful thank you yeah chronic pain robs people of their dignity and their their happiness and joy in life and and also their loved ones the people that care about them yeah because they suffer with you yeah, yeah. a lot well congratulations and praise God yes. you found us thank you very much and uh, I think you're gonna do fantastic I'm looking forward to being strong again. <laughs> awesome. Yes. All right. Hi there, Dr. Duke Majin joining you after we've just walked out of the operating room. I checked on the next patient, uh, spent a few minutes talking to her. She's going to be another Duke laser disc repair where I'm actually going in once again 
from the side called transforaminal endoscopic. So it's a tiny incision, no open surgery. It's done with an incision in a tube that comes in just under the exiting nerve root, this yellow thing here being the nerve root. Can you guys see that? Yes. Oh yeah, good. Yes, we can. And you can see the herniation right there. It'd be nice if the herniation was one color and the normal disc was the other. But basically with the Duke laser disc repair, <coughs> sorry, I'm having to grab some visual aids. Not the kind you're thinking. And I'm coming in through the foramen like this, right into the herniation. And then I'm pushing it back inside the disc and then taking out the pieces using a laser, cleaning out the tear so it heals itself. Duke laser disc repair. We just watched a gentleman from Arizona who traveled here last week to get this procedure done, actually over the weekend. And um, he's been suffering with chronic back pain, lower back pain like everybody gets. He has it uh, for 40 years, kind of on and off at first, 40 years ago when he was young. And then as he's gotten older, the pain just set in and stayed there. And it's really, I mean, I'm going to show you, okay, the guy is walking like this when he came in, you know. He can't straighten his back up because when you straighten your back up, well, you get to see my belly, first of all. But when you straighten your back up, what happens is you're pinching the nerves going out the holes so the nerves come out the holes right here when you straighten up look what happens to that hole it gets smaller and when you lean forward the holes get bigger okay smaller bigger smaller bigger you can rewind that as many times as you want when you stand up and straighten up you're literally putting pressure on the nerves that come out of the holes called the neural foramen they go down your legs so you're going to get weakness, numbness, tingling, and sciatic pain, neurogenic claudication, all right? These are five things that you get from pinched nerves, nerve roots specifically as they exit the foramen when you have stenosis and you go into extension with standing. Um, quality of his life is horrible. Can you imagine walking around hunched forward with a cane all day for years? And the problem is, is you can't enjoy life that way. So. Thank God he found out about Duke Spine and our endoscopic laser surgery. And I think he's going to, he's not going to suddenly stand up straight and start walking straight. He needs some physical therapy to rebuild the muscles, mobilize his back, build up his core strength. And that's already set up for him. But we've now taken away the source of his leg pain and weakness, numbness, and tingling by decompressing the nerve roots. Surgery went very well, actually, went better than I expected. We had a little hitch um, at L5S1. That's the bottom disc where I came in and this joint right there, that facet joint, you can kind of see it right here. His is big, it's built up over the years from arthritis. So when I came in to hit that little disc right there, the facet, my needle hit the facet and it literally was so big it pushed my needle to the side like this. So as I went in, it pushed it and I was kind of like right here on the disc, I don't want to be there. So I went in with the dilator, replanted it right where it was supposed to be by pulling and got it in. So we got the job done. All right, what questions do we have? All right, first question comes from Trevor on YouTube. And he said, after a lumbar fusion, <clears throat> is it normal for the uh, facet joints to degenerate further? I've been fused with, uh, I've been fused from L2 to S1 and my last MRI showed uh, facet joints to be getting worse. Hi, Trevor. Great question. Thanks for asking. So Trevor, Trevor has asked us an amazing question. I'm glad he did. He said, Dr. Duke, um, first of all, let's talk about what are the facet joints. There's two types of joints in the spine, in the m normal part of the spine. Okay, there's some weird joints at the very top at the cervical, C1, C2, occiput C1. They, they rarely ever get involved. And then you have this SI joint at the bottom, but forget about those. Let's talk about the normal joints in the back. You've got two types of joints. The disc is a joint, and you've got these little joints back here called facet joints, okay? Now, Trevor is asking a question. Dr. Duke, if, if I get a fusion, all right, I'm fusing across my disc, but also I'm fusing across the facet joints, right? Yes. So if you're fused, there's no more movement because that's what fusion does, it stops the movement across the joints that you're fusing. So there shouldn't be any more movement there right? And the answer is yes, you're right. There shouldn't be any more movement at the facet joints that are being fused. So then could they get worse? 
if there's no movement? The answer is 100% no. They cannot get worse if there's no movement. Joints that are arthritic and hypertrophied that you fuse that stop moving, they don't get worse. They may get a little better over time, but they definitely don't get worse. So maybe what they're talking about, Trevor, is the joint above your fusion, this one right there. See, there's a fusion, the metal. Okay, there's no movement there, but there is movement above. And there's hyper movement now, especially because these surgeons, when they put the screws in, they end up screwing up the joint. They damage the joint because they're sloppy. And once you damage the joint up here, you're gonna end up having problems with that joint. That's trauma to the joint from the surgery. It's called iatrogenic. Surgeons do it all the time. They're just sloppy. When I did fusions like this, I was very careful. I never messed with the joint above the fusion or below. You can actually see a white capsule. If you go watch my fusion videos from years ago, I got tons of them on YouTube. You can see when I get to the top facet above where I'm gonna fuse, there's a, I take a, a, a cob retractor and I literally gently scrape the muscle off that so you can see the capsule and I make sure I don't get involved in the capsule. You leave the capsule alone. If the surgeon bovies or damages that facet, which about 90% of them do, then you're gonna end up with adjacent facet disease, which is the same thing as adjacent segment disease, and you're gonna end up needing more surgery. So if you're talking about these facets, it's probably from the surgeon's surgery, all right? I don't know if I answered your question, but I hope I did. That's it. That's it, come on guys, you gotta ask more questions. Uh, from Mary Roscoe, she did say on YouTube, she said, thank you, Dr. Duke and Oh, no, 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 We don't yeah. wanna say that. Yeah. Well, I guess Mary is mentioning it, um, so I won't say anything. We believe in HIPAA. HIPAA means protecting patient health information, but one of the family me one of the family members is commenting. So that's all, I'll leave it at that. You are welcome. It is our pleasure. We love seeing people get better. That's why we're here. I could have retired years ago. I have enough to retire. 10 years ago, I could have retired and been happy, okay? So why do I stick it out? And why do I keep running this company? Because if I shut these doors, there's gonna be thousands of people who live with back pain and neck pain, and it destroys their lives, okay? And when you have a problem that can be fixed, you fix it. And when you're the only one in the world that can fix the problem, you can't close your doors. You've gotta stay open. And so until this treatment gains traction, until more people are doing it, until I have established basically the Duke Spine teaching and philosophy and treatment around the world, I cannot rest. I must keep going. It's my calling and honestly, I have very little control over it. Uh, I'm not the kind of person who likes to sit around and do nothing. Um, so I love what I do. My team is a great team. They support me. The patients support us, and um, as long as we keep helping people get the quality of life back, I'm gonna keep being here. So thank you for your com comments. Um, and for those of you who have time, we're gonna be doing two more surgeries today. Our next patient is a female with some back pain, but mostly left calf pain and numbness and tingling and weakness. We're gonna be uh, doing an L45, L5S1, left side, Duke laser disc repair for pinched nerves. And then after her, we've got one more lumbar Duke laser disc repair. So you're welcome to stick around and start thinking 